What I want to speak about today is uh, the theme of the simultaneous absence and presence of Guernica in contemporary art. And I've given this talk the overall title of Lamentations um, because I think that at the end of the day is the, the key theme of the painting itself. Um, let's see, how do I advance this? So, well, before I, before I get to that first theme, uh, I want to make a point that feels a little ungracious, which is that the biomorphic surrealist vocabulary of Guernica is in fact rarely used by contemporary artists. Yesterday, we, we saw many examples of quotations from Guernica or paraphrases of Guernica, but they were in vernacular art, in the art made for street protests or, or murals in cities, um, not in what we tend to think of still as fine art or high art. Of, of course, there are exceptions like Sophie Matisse and Sean, what's his last name, Landers, but rather than looking for more examples of actual quotation of the formal language of Guernica, what I want to do is to look at the, the themes of Picasso's painting, the, the, the ideas, the feelings, the experiences that are embodied in the painting and see how those experiences appear in contemporary art. So this is a detail from an early stage of the painting. T.J. Clark, in his wonderful talk yesterday, showed the, the whole view of this. And it's an image of protest. The, the, the warrior who is the, the primary victim or of, of the painting, he's dead, he's lying dead or badly injured on the ground, and yet the spirit of resistance is so strong in him that he raises his hand towards the sky in a fist at later points in the painting, the, the fist was clutching a, a sheaf of wheat and so forth. And yet this rhetoric of protest, as, as T.J. Clark noted, is ultimately abandoned by Picasso. Instead, the, the horse, the wounded horse, appears in this part of the painting. And this is not actually the first time that this change happens in Picasso. I, I mean, this is something I spoke about last time I lectured in Malaga. In 1936, Picasso had been commissioned to do a set design for Le 14 Juillet by Romain Rolland, a play about the French Revolution. This was a celebration of the triumph of the Popular Front in the elections of the spring of 1936. And he began with an image of protest and then abandoned it. Um, there were par particular political reasons why I think why he chose to do that in 1936. But I think there's also a kind of emotional back and forth here that a questioning, a skepticism in Picasso's mind about the meaning or the value of this gesture. Uh, to, to put this in more context, let's look at another picture, also done in 1937, I think for the Spanish pavilion. This is a painting called Madrid 1937, Black Airplanes by Horacio Ferrer de Morgado. It's now in the Reina Sofia Museum. And it, it shows a response to the bombing of Madrid. And, and this is a theme I'm going to come back to, which is that we think of Guernica as a, the painting of Guernica as a response to the bombing of Guernica, which seems logical. But it, I believe it is also a response to the bombing of Madrid. And in November 1936, and I, I think subsequently, and he, I, I, this is information which I get from the new volume, the final volume of John Richardson's biography of Picasso, which has just been published in the United States, uh, but which I was fortunate enough to have a chance to read uh, a few months ago. And I will come back to the, the content of the, of the, the bombing, the, the historical experience, but let's look for the moment at Ferrer de Morgado's painting. 
Here is that gesture of the raised fist. We have a, a woman with a baby. This is another familiar motif from Guernica um, with a bared breast, which reminds us of the Caritas Romanas, the, the symbol not just of maternity, but of the good state, the good city state that cares for its citizens. And she is shaking her fist in anger at the at the airplanes that are assaulting the city. So this is the kind of gesture that Picasso considered and then rejected. Uh, it turns out, again, I, 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 this is what I learned from John Richardson's book, although I think he was drawing on the research of my colleague Miriam Basilio, that this painting, that there was not, in fact, a very mixed reception of Guernica at the Spanish Pavilion in Paris in 1937. And there was a proposal to take it down and replace it with this painting, that this painting was seen as a more effective symbol of the appropriate response to the bombing of Guernica uh, than Picasso's painting. I mean, by now, obviously, Picasso's painting is acknowledged as such a great masterpiece that you know it's unimaginable that this could have been preferred i mean it's a good painting but it's not a masterpiece of the same level but it is a more direct and intelligible symbol of protest so what exactly is wrong with this rhetoric of the raised fist it, it seems to me that it i mean this is these are questions that we began to talk about i began to talk about yesterday that there is a kind of Manichaean quality to the raised fist, that it divides the world neatly into the good, the good side and the bad side, the, the heroes and the villains. And at some level, I think Picasso rejected that idea, that division, and that's why he suppressed this gesture. Now, I want to come closer to the present and look at the status of this gesture in more recent art. And here's a work, uh, the sort of trademark work of contemporary Chinese art by the great painter Fang Lijun. This is from 1999. And Fang Lijun is a leading artist from what was known as cynical realism, uh, an important movement of the 1990s. And here we see a crowd of people protesting angrily, enraged, marching here and there, several of them with raised fists, this very familiar gesture. But who are they? What are they protesting? This is utterly unclear, and I think deliberately unclear. And the painting, in fact, generates a sense of the absurdity of protest. Um, I mean, in the particular circumstances of China in the 1990s, post the, after the massacre at Tiananmen Square in 1989, there would have been an awareness that in fact, genuine protest was impossible, that the government would not tolerate it. And of course, you know, given contemporary, the contemporary situation, that lack of toleration in the 1990s the, has been followed up with a similar type of repression today. There was a more liberal interlude in the middle um, but what, what I think Fang, the artist here, is trying to convey is not just that protest is futile, but that it is, in a sense, absurd, that um, it is characteristic of the school of cynical realism, that the people in it, they're generally men, a crowd of men, um, that they look a little deranged, that they're protesting not because they have a clear idea of a cause, but just because the fever of protest has overtaken them. And again, looking at the specifically Chinese context, I, I think this has to do with the tragic history of the Cultural Revolution and the way in which Mao Zedong summoned up protests against his own government, you know, empowered young people to join in the Red Guards and to protest and to stage trials in a way that was extraordinarily painful and destructive for China as a whole. So that, to make a gross generalization, it seems to me that politically engaged Chinese people of the 1980s and the 90s 
knew from their own experience that the the thrill of being angry and protesting and saying you know here's the right side here's the wrong side that that thrilling emotion could be as damaging as destructive as it could be productive or maybe even more damaging and destructive so if we look at a, a different group of artists concerned with the problem of protest we find a kind of antithetical gesture. So here on the left, I'm showing you a film still from a well-known work, Silence Equals Death, by the AIDS activist David Wojnarowicz in, in New York. And the specific context for this work was in the early stages of the AIDS epidemic when the American government did practically nothing to increase research to try to figure out what was causing AIDS to, to issue serious medical guidance. There's a strange historical irony in connection to our present circumstance. The leader of medical research for the United States government at that time was Anthony Fauci, who is still pretty much in that position. Um, and Fauci was widely denounced within the gay community as being cold and indifferent to the suffering of the victims of AIDS and was in fact talked around. I mean, the, 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 the activists convinced him that something needed to be done and he became very active, proactive in, in pushing for more research, which led ultimately to the treatments and preventative measures that have that are in place today that have made AIDS a frightening and chronic disease, but not a vast fatal epidemic. In any case, at the moment when Wojnarowicz made this film, uh, the government seemed to be doing nothing. And to express his sense of this nothingness, that not to speak up, that to fail to protest was a disaster, Wojnarowicz literally, as you can see, sewed his lips together in a kind of gesture of enforced silence. Now, as you can see on the right, this is a work by a contemporary Russian artist, Peter Pavlensky. Um, this gesture has been picked up. It's been repurposed. Uh, that Pavlensky is referring to the dictatorship of Vladimir Putin in Russia today and then, and to today as in 2012, and a government that does not tolerate protest, um, is utterly unresponsive to it, that has done its best to suppress every form of democratic interaction. And that the impossibility of protest, the futility of it is something that is signaled by Pavlensky's adoption of this gesture uh, so that in contrast to the raised fist, which in the end has a kind of optimism of, yes, we will fight, we will change the world, we will make things better through our anger and our protest. These two artists are registering protest by conspicuously making themselves silent, going to an opposite extreme. Now I want to turn to the role of victims in Guernica and as I mentioned earlier, that the chief victim is the dead warrior, but we also see on the left, the woman more crying, holding a baby who I, I think within the narrative of the painting, we are meant to understand as a, a dead baby, that she is not just weeping over the generalized violence, but over a specific personal loss. So we have these two victims, the man and the child. And also on the right, the, the screaming wounded horse who was inserted into this part of the painting, uh, largely to cover up the gesture. I mean, I don't mean exclusively to cover up the raised fist, but in practice, eliminating that gesture of protest and replacing it with the, the gesture of, with the image of, of the wounded horse and clearly a victim. I mean, we were talking yesterday about the ambiguity of the bull. Um, this one is the, the horse, there's nothing ambiguous about it. Now here is where the new evidence that comes from um, Miriam Basilio and John Richardson seems most relevant. Uh, Richardson repeats, uh, reprints a 
article written by the French journalist Louis Delapray describing the aerial bombing of Madrid in November 1936. And Delapray wrote, the darkness shrouding Madrid is so thick that you can cut it with a knife. Defenseless, we hear above our heads the deep musical vibration that is the herald of death. Um, I'm summarizing a bit. Uh, Delapre encounters a young woman lying in the street who is visibly dying and, or has just died. And he writes, the beam from an electric flashlight illuminates the corpse. An ambulance driver comes by and picks up another corpse, the corpse of a baby, and places it atop the dead woman's breast and says to Delapre, to the reporter, they'll pick her up tomorrow, and then he drives off. So Richardson argues very convincingly that Picasso must have read this article, this reportage from Madrid, and suggests that it, it was at the back of his head if not forefront in his consciousness when he created this image of the, the weeping mother with the dead child, that it's actually a transmutation of, of this newspaper story and this extremely vivid description of death and suffering in Madrid. So this obviously is, is un unlike protest, is one of the parts of the painting that continues to resonate extremely powerfully and here I'd like to, again, fast forward to something in contemporary art, in fact, a work of art by one of our speakers today, William Kentridge, who, as you know, works in multiple media, but perhaps is best known for his animations, uh, which he does in a highly unusual technique, where he'll do a drawing in charcoal on a large sheet of paper. He, he photographs it. He then erases a little bit, redraws it. So he animates it, you know, normally old fashioned cartoons were made by having a, a fixed background and then figures that were cut out and placed on top that could be changed. Whereas Kentridge would actually, actually redraws his figures and each sheet of paper corresponds to a shot in a movie to a, a particular framing, a point of view and when he gets to the end of a scene where normally in a, a live uh, movie, the camera would move, there'd be a new shot. Then he abandons work on the drawing and the drawing then becomes a finished work of art and goes to a museum or a collector. And then he does a new drawing, which is the basis for the next shot for the next sequence of his film. So here we are seeing the opening phase of a, a film called The History of the Main Complaint. And as you can see on the left, there is a man dressed incongruously in a pinstripe suit with a tie lying in a hospital bed. And his name is Soho Eckstein. He is a kind of alter ego of the artist, as, as you'll see in a few minutes when we, we see Kentridge's presentation, this is what he looks like. Um, and he has two primary alter egos in his, in his animations. So who, Soho Eckstein, who is a wealthy industrialist, and uh, Felix Teitelbaum, who is a poor artist. And the real William Kentridge is both of these people and other people besides. So here we see Soho Eckstein in a hospital bed. He seems to be recovering from a heart attack or, or some kind of crisis. And at the right, there is a monitor, uh, which you would think if it's a heart attack would be electrocardiogram monitor, but it's not, it's a, it's a sonogram, um, you know, one of those things that uses uh, sound waves to probe the inside of the body to see what's happening with an organ or to check on the health of a, a baby, uh, an embryo. Um, so there's this monitor next to him. And in this, this panel, we see the title of the work, the history of the main complaint, but then imagery begins to appear in the monitor and um, this becomes the main sort of stage for the action rather than the hospital room. And I'm sorry, I don't have better illustrations of this. Uh, the, the just, it's been hard to find publications with really good reproductions. So here are the, I'm sorry, these are a bunch of little ones, low resolution. 
So here the action has shifted to the scene of a man driving. But as you can see, the, the view through the windscreen of his car is equated with the view that was on the sonogram monitor. And what we see, what he sees, I mean, we see his eyes in close up, you know, looking in the rear view mirror, but then we also see what he's seeing in front of him, looking out the front of the car is um, two men kicking a third man in the road, the third man lying on the ground and being assaulted by the other two. And it, it turns out that this scene has a particular autobiographical source for, for Kentridge. In his um, Norton lectures of 2014, which are called Six Drawing Lessons, Kentridge has a section called Knowledge as Shame. And recalling his childhood in Johannesburg, he, he describes driving with his grandfather, passing a side street, a glance, man lying in the gutter, four men around him, kicking his body, kicking his head, the shock of adult violence. The nine-year-old knows about kicking someone, but to kick a person in the head, in the face, the world had to rearrange itself to accommodate this new knowledge. The image was seen. They passed, that is to say, his grandfather and him driving along. No mention was made. So th this moment clearly for the young Kentridge was a, a moment of revelation of the unspeakable violence of the world. The, the possibility and not, not just the possibility, the existence of horrific violence all around us. And I think it contains the thought or the feeling that not to be a victim is in some sense to be complicit in that violence, that we are all, if we are well enough to be standing or sitting here in this auditorium today, fortunately at this moment, we are not victims but in some sense, we are benefiting from the world being organized the way it is, which includes the terrible violence that, you know, even as I stand here speaking is occurring in many places around the world. So it, it, it seems to me that Kentridge is posing a, a moral dilemma for us here. Is there a way to represent this violence without diminishing its awful truth? Maybe silence, such as we just saw in the work of David Wojnarowicz and Peter Pavlensky, is the only possible response, that to speak of violence, to explain it, becomes all too easily to explain it away, to diminish its importance, to justify it, to give it a logic. And that is what the, those two artists will not do, and that is what Kentridge does not do. He simply presents it as a horrific fact of, of experience. And of course, in the context of this particular film, that is the main complaint. The main complaint is not just the medical problems of a particular man, but is the serious illness of a society which was still living in the condition of apartheid under the apartheid regime at the time that Kentridge made this video. So now let me present a different kind of attempt to represent or evoke violence and victims, uh, which is this work by Christian Boltanski, Holy Week from 1994. Here we see a different strategy. Used clothes, coats in this case, stand in for the bodies of the victims of violence as, as usual in Boltanski's work, one assumes that the ultimate reference here is to the Holocaust, um, which T.J. Clark and other people, uh, Andrea Junta spoke of yesterday. And I think the specific link here is our knowledge that when people were murdered in the concentration camps and the death camps, everything they owned was taken from them. Um, if you go to the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C., for instance, there are rooms with piles of eyeglasses, such as these, of eyeglass shoes, that were taken from the Jews and the gypsies and the other people who were murdered to be saved, to be reused. Um, 
But what is, what is the significance of the fact that Boltanski has evoked these victims in the aisle of a church and that the work is called Holy Week, which as you all know better than I is the week leading up to Easter. This commemorates Christ's passion. So I, I think that the, the setting of the work presents a set of contradictory ideas. On the one hand, a sense that every victim is an avatar of Christ, that the, the passion, the suffering, the perhaps redemptive suffering is, makes every victim sacred, makes every act of su such act of suffering sacred. But on the other hand, given the history of anti-Semitism and the role of Catholicism in supporting that anti-Semitism, there's a contradiction in here that it's as effect as if we are grie grieving for the victims in the space of the perpetrators in the space of the persecutors. I mean, not, I'm not trying to suggest that you know, all, at all times, at all places, Christians are persecutors, but there is this historical link um, to you know, the tradition of anti-Semitism so that the work ends up being deeply contradictory. I, I was suggesting a few minutes ago that there was a contradiction or a problem embedded in the representation of protest. And now I, I guess I'm trying to point to a similar contradiction in the representation of victimhood. And here, here is another version of that. Uh, this is by the Turkish artist Selim Birsel, working with several assistants. Uh, this is part of a large exhibition that took place in Ankara, in the capital of Turkey, in 1995, called Gar, which is the you know, word for train station, as in French. But the, the specific work of these uh, pieces of cloth that have been stiffened with some kind of glue is um, lead sleep or bullet sleep, the Turkish is Kursan Uykusu. And the more precise description from a, a catalog is that these are 12 body molds made of paper painted with graphite and poster glue lying on the ground in front of the entrance to the restaurant by the first platform inside the Ankara railway station. They were actually created on site. Um, the artist and his assistants lay down on the platform. The uh, fabric was put over them or the paper rather was put over them and then the glue and graphite were applied and then the, they crawled out from underneath it. Um, these were then removed by the management of the station the very next day. And the reason that was given for removing them was that they demoralized society. Uh, there was a great deal of newspaper coverage of this. Now to, I mean, the gesture here of evoking dead bodies by placing some kind of fabric or fabric-like substance on the ground is obviously similar to that of Boltanski. Um, the political context here, or the historical context is, is more specific and different. Um, this happened, you know, it was part of the ongoing, was created in the context of the ongoing uh, Kurdish, it's even to know how hard to describe it in a way that's not prejudicial, um, the struggle between, on one hand, between the Kurdish guerrilla group, PKK, uh, and then it's, it's non, which is generally regarded as a terrorist organization, I think rightly so. Um, and the non other groups representing the Kurds who are nonviolent, who are, you know, do not take part in these violent actions. Um, there was a ceasefire. Well, a little more context here may be useful. As, as you probably know, there are significant groups of Kurds in parts of Iraq, in the eastern parts of Syria, and in the eastern parts of Turkey. And there is a long standing nationalist movement. There are people who would like to establish a Kurdish state, sometimes referred, sometimes referred to as Kurdistan, um, you know, chopping off pieces of those three existing countries and unifying them within a new national entity. Um, and 
Tim Clark yesterday showed us that briefly that image of the uh, women who were serving as soldiers or as mourners uh, within the Kurdish struggle. Uh, but there's, I mean, that's a maximalist demand. And as you can imagine, um, whoever the president of Turkey is, and Erdogan was not yet in power when this happened in 1995, uh, no one is really prepared to see a third of his country chopped off and become part of some other country, um, and so too in Syria and Iraq. There's a less you know, extreme demand by the less violent factions, representatives of the Kurdish people, that they simply want recognition. They want it to be legal to teach classes in Kurdish, for their language to be taught, for their culture to be accepted. So there's an extremely ambiguous situation of what are the desires, what are the demands exactly. In any case, at the, the, the work you're looking at here was made uh, during a ceasefire that had been declared between the PKK and the Turkish government, uh, where the PKK said that they would withdraw their demand for secession, for the formation of a separate Kurdish state, uh, the, that the then president of Turkey was prepared to negotiate with them. Tragically, he died before this could occur. The Turkish army resumed its attacks on the PKK. The PKK in turn massacred people in a number of villages, Kurdish villages who they felt had cooperated too much with the government. Uh, the Turkish army's counterinsurgency program like the notorious American counterinsurgency programs in Vietnam um, destroyed 3000 Kurdish villages and created 2 million refugees during this time and the PKK continued its attacks on Kurdish villages that continued to be controlled by the government. So here the, the victimhood does not have an obvious right or wrong. This is, I think it is important to see it as an evocation of the victims of both sides, that it's, it's you know, what is happening to the people who are suffering, to all those people who are being killed and displaced without specifically blaming one side or the other or, or blaming both sides. So the, the non-specific victimhood of Guernica, which you know, when we look only at Picasso's painting may seem like a problem. You know, why isn't he being more specific? Why, why is this so generalized? Uh, it seems to me that this could be seen in historical perspective as a a, a, a profound strategy of uh, you know, drawing our attention, you know, asking us to be attentive to victims and without attaching them to us, without feeling compelled to support a cause. From here, I want to shift to uh, the topic of lamentations, which I used for my title and then ended up with fewer specific examples, but so it goes. Um, so here on the left, we see the mother again lamenting over her child, and on the right, the woman screaming, lamenting with her arms raised. It, it, it seems to me, and you know, I, I had a lot of material on this topic, which I then cut out in order to stay focused on contemporary art, but if you think of this historically, it seems to me that Picasso is summing up a tradition of lamentations in that are crucial to Christian imagery, something you find in Byzantine art, in medieval art, in Renaissance art, where you see women weeping over the dead Christ. So that it, it, from that point of view, um, the dead warrior becomes no longer a warrior, although he is holding a sword, but becomes Christ, after the crucifixion and the women at left and right are mourning him. And indeed the woman holding her child in this context becomes a kind of pieta where traditionally there's this, you know, or often Mary is represented as being young so that she is simultaneously the aged Mary lamenting the death of her grown son and the young Mary holding her infant, but knowing somehow what his fate is going to be 30 years later. Um, so much more could be said about this. This is a point that has been made in the Picasso literature in passing. Um, but I, I, you know, I think there's more to be done to, to really take this seriously. Um, 
but I'm not today. What I did want to add was this image at the left, the weeping woman. I mean, there's a long series of these images, many prints, drawings, um, several canvases. And these are often interpreted as portraits of Dora Maar's individual psychology. And when people write about them, they almost always quote Picasso's statement, Dora for me was always the weeping woman. And um, it, it seems to me that like many things Picasso said, this is simply not true. That there are many portraits of Dora preceding 1937 in which she is not the weeping woman. This image of Dora as a weeping woman is not a source for Guernica, it's a sequel to Guernica. The sequence of prints and, and paintings follows the painting rather that Dora Maar becomes the vehicle for his image of lamentation, that having arrived at that powerful image in Guernica, he then wanted to continue exploring it and, and use these portraits of Dora Maar as a vehicle for doing so. I mean, I don't know that Dora Maar wasn't also a weeping woman. Um, Richardson's biography paints her as an angry, upset, reproachful woman rather than a weeping woman. But, you know, I, I, I really do not want to get stuck in the biographical here, but to look at this image of grief as an image, as a statement about the world, about the necessity of weeping, not just for, not, not as a biographical incident in the life of Dora Maar, but as a statement about the human condition. And so I've, I've paired this on the right with a well-known performance by the Dutch artist, Bas John Adder. I'm too sad to tell you. And there are actually multiple versions of this image. There are photographs uh, of him, in, in this case, with short hair and other photographs done, I think, somewhat earlier. He has very long hair, as many people did in 1970. Uh, there's also films of him performing <laughs> this weeping. Uh, the, the key feature of all of these versions of I'm too sad to tell you is that he never explains why he's weeping. It is, it is grief, unbearable sadness, detached from any particular cause, um, which I think calls out to us to interpret it as, well, it could be something that is so deeply personal that he can't bear to speak of it, but it could also be a response to the state of the world, the unbearable sadness of the state of the world in 1970 or in 2021. And this in turn inspired the work on the left by the Dutch artist, Mark Bijel, I'm Too Sad to Kill You from 2001. And Bijel was, or is, a kind of provocateur who often works in the medium of graffiti. As you can say, see here, he's just spray painted this onto a wall. Uh, a lot of his performances could, or his works consisted of spray painting the outsides of museums uh, with words like, you know, terror or love and hate, sometimes with the permission of the museum, sometimes just, you know, as a kind of guerrilla action by night, <clears throat> which would then be erased the next day. But what does it mean? What, what is Bijel's statement? You know, why, why, why twist Boss John Adder's phrase this way? I'm too sad to kill you. And I, I think this leads back to a reflection on the relative roles of sadness and anger in, in politics that, you know, circling back to the idea of protest that we're accustomed to thinking of anger as a motivating force, as an engine for change. And we're accustomed perhaps to thinking of sadness and, or depression as something immobilizing that keeps, you know, that if you're too sad, if someone is too sad to tell you, then they're too sad to actually get out there and do something to try to change the world. But I, I take Bijil's statement as a criticism of that clear dichotomy, as a way of saying that the anger, the implied violence, the Manichaean thinking implicit in the raised fist of protest that I started with is not in fact a productive way of changing the world. And that perhaps a deep sense of sadness of the communion amongst 
victims of, of, of oppression, of exploitation, of disease, of poverty is more effective in the long run in motivating change than um, the very, you know, much more satisfying emotion of anger. And that leads to the, the catalog on the right. Um, so we're returning to Turkey here and to um, the, that same context of the uh, struggle about Kurdish rights. Uh, this is a catalog of an exhibition organized by an important um, Turkish artist, Halil Altandere. And indeed, I thought, well, Altandere must have done a work of his own called I'm Too Sad to Kill You. So I wrote to my friend Vasif Kortan, the great Turkish curator, and asked him about that. And Vasif explained that no, Altandere never actually did a particular work, but he did consciously borrow uh, the title of Bijil's work for this exhibition. So what does it have to do with it? I mean, I, you know, I've just been reading the catalog from this show and there's no work in it that is specifically about violence, exploitation and oppression and so forth. The key point about this exhibition is that it was the first to include many artists from the Eastern part of Turkey. Traditionally, the cultural life of Turkey has been focused on Istanbul, on the West on the part of the country most in touch with Europe. And there's been a kind of prejudice or neglect of the uh, you know, more rural oriented, more traditional parts of the country, which are also the places where say um, Erdogan's party receives its primary support. So Alton Derry was specifically reaching out here to create a more inclusive portrait of Turkish art. And I think rejecting the dichotomy of well, the sophisticated right-thinking artists are all in Istanbul, and if people are further east, they're going to be part of the conservative, religious, nationalistic part of the country. Um, so that this is, in a, in a way, uh, touching on the same point as Selim Bursel's installation at, at the train station. Turning to a different element of Guernica, um, I'm showing you again the uh, markings, which Carolyn Levitt, I think very persuasively interpreted yesterday as signs for typefaces in newspaper, that this is in effect a sheet of newspaper or the newspaper coverage of, of the events at Guernica um, projected onto or placed onto the body of the wounded horse. And so I want to trace the way in which this kind of documentation has become an important feature in contemporary art. Uh, here I'm showing you Felix Gonzalez Torres's well-known work, Death by Gun, which is a stack of hundreds of identical sheets of paper. This is an unlimited edition. Visitors are encouraged to take a piece of paper, to take it home, and it can be infinitely printed and replenished so that each day when the gallery or museum opens, the same stack is there that was there the day before. But the specific content of this work, what's on each sheet is a series of photographs and captions, each showing the faces of the 460 people who were killed by guns in the United States, which as you know, tragically a gun happy country that I come from, in one week, in the week of May 1st through 7th, 1989. And each person, each victim is identified by their name, age, city and state, with a very brief description of the circumstances under which they were killed, under which they died. So there's no interpretation, there's no political program, there is simply a statement of the, the brute factuality of, of death and, and loss. Uh, another approach to this, approach of using documentation to convey the effect, the historical reality of a tragedy, is these famous works by Wale, the Lebanese artist Walid Rod, are working at this point under the name the Atlas Group, which was a mythical group of Lebanese historians uh, who in Rod's fabulation about this were documenting the effects of the Lebanese civil war, which 
in theory went on from 1975 to 1990, but in many ways is continuing today or has been rekindled today in the wake of the explosion of the ammonia, ammonium nitrate in the harbor and the various battles that are taking place, the, the destruction of downtown Beirut in that explosion and now the street battles that are taking place um, now. Um, in any case, one of the, the horrible features of the Civil War was the frequent use of car bombings as a method of, of political aggression, uh, where cars were loaded with bombs and then exploded somewhere. And as you can see in the work on the, the left, uh, what remained after a car bombing, it turns out, was the cylinder block of the engine, that a, even a bomb powerful enough to completely demolish the car and adjacent buildings and to kill hundreds of people around the car, the cylinder block would survive. And it was therefore possible to see what kind of car it was, to see what the registration number was and so forth. Um, and in the work on the right, uh, Rod is identifying the, the mark of, I, I think that's a Volvo that was used in a car bombing. So this mythical group of historians, the Atlas group, in response to this you know, horrific set of terrorist attacks on the Lebanese people, methodically, in, in theory, methodically figure out you know, which car, what, you know, what were the circumstances, which engine and so forth. And um, Rod uh, signifies, summarizes, in a sense, the, the emotional effect of this with the title on the right, the truth will be known when the last witness is dead. Then it will no longer be possible to invoke facts. It will just be a battle of propaganda. Now, I see the red light has gone off here. So um, let me try to move more rapidly to a conclusion. Um, I was going to show you, speaking of memorials, uh, Dara Salcido has already been spoken of, uh, so I will not dwell on her work, the sense of a life entombed by the, uh, the long Colombian Civil War, which for the moment is on hold. And then also picking up on the kind of event uh, that uh, Andrea Junta spoke of yesterday, uh, this work, Memorial by Luis Kamnitzer, uh, in Uruguay, as in Argentina, there was a, a there was a military dictatorship that simply disappeared a great number of people. No trial; they were just rounded up and never heard from again. And Kamnitzer, to memorialize these people, took the phone book from Montevideo, cut it up, and inserted the names of those who had vanished into the phone book as if they were still alive. And when you look at all these pages on display at the Museum of Modern Art. The only way you can tell the names of the dead from the names of the living is the dead do not have addresses or they do not have phone numbers. It's an absence. The, the absence of that information marks their absence from the world of the living. And so finally, coming back to Picasso's painting as a whole, it, it seems to me that this is ultimately a memorial and a, obviously a memorial, a memorial to the victims of Guernica but one that in its ambiguity it serves as a memorial for all the other victims I've just been talking about. Thank you.